Hello, everybody. Uh, we are about to begin our next session, so if you are still munching on your pastries and uh, enjoying your coffee, feel free to bring all refreshments back to the tables and do join us. Uh, my name is Stephen Sacker. I work for the BBC. I present a show on the BBC World News called Hard Talk. And for those of you who have been here before, and I understand that is a pretty select band of you, uh, you'll know I was here last year. I was rather disturbed to learn that they have a very strict re-invitation policy here, which means hardly anybody gets the privilege of coming here twice. So I suspect after today they're going to take me behind the shed and put me out of my misery, put me down humanely, because I'll have been here twice, and that's more than enough, I'm sure, for both you and maybe for me too. Um, it is a pleasure to be here, though. Uh, I enjoyed myself last time because I, there was a huge passionate debate at that point, probably more about you know freedom of expression than anything else. This year, as we've already heard in the first panel, things have moved on. Um, privacy is a huge issue this year. Do we really know what happens to all of the information about ourselves that we put on the World Wide Web? Have we any idea? who is surveilling us, monitoring us, what is happening to every keystroke that we make on our keyboard. These are issues, of course, that have concerned everybody over the past year. And we've got a terrific panel to take the discussion about privacy uh, into the domains of civil society, business, how individuals need to think about their digital activity and their relationships online. So that's sort of a broad theme. Um, just by way of aside, because I was so, so struck by it in the first panel and also on the Twitter feed, uh, people very obviously passionately exercised about the fact that certain key individuals in this debate, uh, with the names of Snowden and Greenwald et al are not here. I would just say that uh, I did have Glenn Greenwald on my hard talk chair not so very long ago, and a fascinating discussion that was too. I've never had so much feedback in my life, most of it profoundly negative <laughs> about my performance, not his. Uh, but anyway, uh, feel free in the course of our discussion to talk about that again if you really want to. I know we've aired it already. Um, it is very much a discussion. I, maybe even more than the first session, want to get as much reaction on Twitter as possible. So I'm just going to remind you again, if you use the hashtag SIF14A, because this is room A, uh, your comments will get to Marcin and his team over there. And Marcin has been briefed by me to wave his hands up and down, be as physically vigorous as he can be when he's got stuff that he wants to say from the Twitter feed, comments from you. So tweet away, be as offensive as you like. Uh, I will be offended, but don't worry, I'll get over it. Um, so we're going to make it interactive in that way. Of course, we're going to have questions and answers as well. So we want you to be as active as you can be for the next hour and a quarter. Let me quickly introduce you to the panel, and then we'll get the discussion going straight away. Um, starting on this side of our comfortable sofas, uh, let me introduce you to Sana Salim, who's director of Bolo B in Pakistan. Um, and very active in this debate about both the internet and privacy, all sorts of implications for the South, if we can put it that way, the emerging world of, of uh, the opportunities and challenges of the internet. Next to uh, Sana, uh, we have Dunya Miatovic, who is the OSCE representative on freedom of the media, the OSCE of course, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, currently rather engaged with what's happening in Ukraine, different part of your organization, I know, Dunya, but nonetheless, interesting internet issues to be discussed in that sphere. Um, on uh, this side of the sofa, uh, give a warm welcome also to Alison Gilwald. Alison is the professor, is, well, should I say, is Professor Alison Gilwald. Gilwald. She's, um, uh, working at Research ICT Africa, based in Joburg, I think. 
Cape Town, got that wrong, sorry. Uh, based in Cape Town, South Africa. Alison, welcome to you. Next to Alison, uh, Mahama Kaul, who is uh, a fellow at the Observer Research Foundation in India. Um, so you can see a panel, this panel, very much focused on uh, the global south, on emerging economies, however you want to put it. But it, it absolutely is committed to uh, getting that perspective uh, out over the next hour or so. And finally, uh, on, on that sofa, uh, warm welcome to Ihab Osman, who is managing partner for Africa TMT, based in Khartoum, Sudan. Uh, so please give a very warm hand to our panel, ladies and gentlemen. So here we are. We've already heard lots of discussion about uh, privacy in uh, the post-Snowden era. Um, but really, we've focused the discussion so far on government, on the state. And it isn't just about government and the state. It's also about big business. It's about civil society organizations. All of the different ways we as individuals connect uh, with others in the digital world, the digital space. So I'm going to start with just a very broad brush question because I want to get everybody's opening big thoughts. And that is, you know, uh, is it actually a time where we have to accept that the traditional notions of privacy do not apply on the internet, that actually privacy is dead? So let's take that thought and run with it for a little while. And Sana, I'm going to ask you to start. Thanks, um, Tiffin. Um, it's, I'm a little uncomfortable even before you ask that question with the whole notion that's been sort of uh, suggested and resuggested that the fact that surveillance is what we need to live with now because that's the way things are and that's the way that it's going to go ahead. I don't think that that is true. Uh, and the, the aftermath of the Snowden Revolution has taught us that and more. So I don't think that uh, privacy is dead online. I think that there are attempts to curb it completely. There are attempts to redefine it, which is worse. You know, saying privacy is dead is probably a more you know, truthful, honest representation of what's going on. But what's worse is that we see a redefin you know, redefining what privacy means, redefining what surveillance means, and Unfortunately, also redefining what mass surveillance means and how it can be legitimate and legal. So, so okay, I think more I, than let, let, I'm going to stop you straight away. What do you mean redefine what privacy means? Give me the redefinition if there is uh, what a I need for it. So how privacy is now being redefined is that you need to live with uh, the fact that you either choose to be private or to uh, have government respect your privacy or to be secure. It, these two are being separated, and we civilians or uh, netizens are being, you know, being forced to make a choice between the two when they shouldn't be mutually exclusive. The fact that governments are actively sort of putting, baiting uh, privacy against security is, is going to effectively be the death of privacy, where in fact there are individuals, there are people, there are companies, there are also governments that do want to work towards reforming mass surveillance policy, that do want to work towards limiting surveillance, curbing those powers. So I don't, I don't believe and I don't think that we should be reinforcing um, this notion is this privacy in fact is dead. I think a lot of people do care about privacy today. A lot of people do want to question people in authority and people in power. The examples of Glenn Greenwald, Snowden, uh, Laura Poitras, others who, who do and who also want to put an end to governments trying to redefine what privacy means, redefine what um, you know, mass surveillance means by legitimizing it, whether it's FISA courts or whether it's, you know, okay. um, yeah. yeah well, uh, Passionate opening, and you assume, I think, fair to say, from your answer, you assume that, that uh, people care passionately about their privacy online. And I just wonder if that's true. I want to explore that a little bit. Dunya, do you think uh, the average uh, internet user, the average sort of uh, citizen of the world, cares as passionately as probably most people in this room about the privacy issue? Well, I don't think I know answer to, to that question, but I think we, we as uh, citizens, as human beings, we do care about our privacy, but at the same time, uh, when we discuss privacy and uh, our rights, we are also a bit unfair, uh, because we also do care about our security. 
At the same time, um, uh, we expect our governments to provide us with uh, um, protection from terrorists, cyber attacks, to fight censorship. Uh, on the other side, we also do want uh, governments to make sure that uh, we can protect our privacy, not to mention freedom of expression and, and freedom of information on, on the internet. So how to strike the balance? Um, we, we have to have uh, a more honest debate when it comes to surveillance. Uh, in a way, we are uh, adapted in this digital era to uh, surveillance, but when, uh, you know, when we think about CCTV and something that is in, in public, we are used to that, and we do not take too much attention uh, when it comes to this kind of surveillance. But when the surveillance is uh, moving into our living rooms and, uh, in, and, and at home, then we do care more about it. Um, so how to strike a balance and to find a way for governments to, to be able to um, protect us and at the same time to enjoy all our rights uh, is the reason why we meet here and why we discuss these things. At the same time, as we speak, uh, and we heard uh, several colleagues mentioning Turkey, uh, during coffee break I spoke to uh, people from Serbia, uh, the information I hear and the laws that are adopted, everything in the name of protection uh, of citizens uh, from terrorism, child abuse, the laws are adopted and the laws are affecting, at the same time, our privacy, freedom of expression, freedom of information. Uh, and it's not just uh, all the uh, new emerging democracies, it's also all democracies engaging in this. And which kind of message is this giving to the developing world is also something that is under question mark. And for me, as the representative of freedom of the media, you mentioned Ukraine, uh, be because of surveillance and because of the way that the governments and uh, not only domestic, but also outside can track bloggers, civil society activists. At the moment in Ukraine, we have several journalists and bloggers arrested uh, and missing. Um, and how to, to you know, do absolutely everything uh, in order to say, yes, security, but not security in the name of something that will affect human rights. Yeah. And too many governments, I think, are ready and not thinking wise enough uh, when they are adopting overnight laws uh, in the name of security and uh, thinking uh, long term how this will affect the society. Too many governments, you say, and I think a lot of people in this room would echo that, and I, I suspect a lot of debate over the course of the two days of this is going to focus on governments and the failings of governments and the lack of trust citizens have in their governments right across the world, whether it be Europe or, or Asia or Latin America or Africa or wherever. I actually don't want to spend all of my ta time talking about governments today because it seems to me, you know, we, we are tasked with talking about privacy and we're talking about data collection and the management of, of data. And it isn't all just about governments. I'm very aware uh, in uh, the UK and in the West there's just been a huge fuss <laughs> because it's uh, just been revealed that eBay, one of the biggest sort of commercial enterprises on the internet, has utterly failed to keep all of its personal, uh, massive sort of personal data store encrypted so that now hackers have managed to uh, gain access to the personal details of millions and millions of eBay users. Uh, we have other similar examples of big corporates failing to manage data security and to co protect people's privacy. So I'm wondering, Alison, from your point of view, sitting in South Africa, whether you spend most of your time on this privacy issue worrying about the malign sort of influence of, of big government and the state, or whether you're actually as worried about failings in the corporate and private sectors. Um, Stephen, I don't want to take you back because you're trying to, to, to move on into the commercial and, and data protection well, I areas, just think, I think but I, I really don't think they can be separated out. So I, before I get to that, I just, I mean, I, I do think that, um, you know, underlying these um, discussions, these internet governance discussions, are certain political and economic assumptions that simply don't pertain to vast parts of the, um, certainly the continent that 
I do my research on. And m a lot of that is outside of South Africa, which is, of course, very different to many of the other environments yeah. in, which, in which one works. Um, so I think these sort of notions that um, there's this blurring of online and offline and that we simply have to you know, make sure that those um, offline rights are brought online um, simply don't pertain for vast parts of the continent. Um, you know, people are desperately trying to get access, and I think something we focus less on, um, affordable access that allows them optimal usage of the internet, that allows them basic access to information. Um, and I think these are, you know, it completely um, interlinked with freedom of expression. I don't think these issues can be, can be separated out. Um, and what you've got in, in, in Africa is this sort of um, bifurcation of um, economic and um, ICT sector development um, from political and human rights um, de political um, development and agenda. So a lot of the um, e economic imperatives for um, growth, you know, cloud services, data protection, etc., come collide at some point with some of the human basic human rights failings that are in many of our jurisdictions. But, but you know, if you're talking about expanding internet access and it being a key to development, as we heard <coughs> in the first session, I'm just wondering whether most people in the countries you study and work in across Africa are really, at the top of their minds, concerned about privacy issues when they are endeavouring to get connected yeah. to the I, web. I don't think they are. No. I, I don't think Could they, they are. I think people are give a far, toss about that? far more concerned about, you know, scraping together, you know, enough of their sense um, to get a, sh a sh short bit of data so that they can go on Facebook Zero for, you know, a couple of minutes. Um, mainly to talk to people who are in their proximity anyway because they can't afford calls to speak to them through other means. They're not even on a kind of global um, network in that sense. So, no, I don't think they are. I think the fact that they're not, though, um, is of concern because I think it, you know, it raises concerns again about the whole surveillance issue. Um, it raises, you know, concerns about how that data should be captured and protected. Um, it raises questions about the lack of trust that simply um, isn't there. I mean, the assumption of these discussions, the, um, that there is, you know, the, the indignation that US citizens or you know, European citizens feel when they discover that, my goodness, their governments are surveilling them. I don't think many Africans have that, really. There isn't that social contract with their governments that they will give up some of those rights, that privacy, et cetera, in order for those kinds of protections. They generally assume, but the consequences of that happening, um, the consequences of um, revelations relating to for example, your sexuality um, has very different implications if that is revealed in the United States or Stockholm to if it's re revealed in Uganda, where, you know, if that is exposed on, on the web or off the web. But That's my point. If you are in it's Uganda, you almost certainly wouldn't reveal, you know, obviously we're, we're thinking about the, 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 the treatment of gays yeah. in Uganda. You probably wouldn't reveal your homosexuality no, on the web outed. in Uganda because you wouldn't be naive enough to think that... No. That, that would be what safe. I'm saying is your on and off net rights, are, that is the issue, is that they are, it's not just about getting on net rights that you have off net. You don't, those rights don't exist. And, you know, yes, you could be outed in the media or in the radio or a whole lot of other forms which you are, but the, uh, the ability of, of social networks to amplify this kind of thing raises very severe issues around privacy, which I'm saying I don't think people are... By and large, are people sort of adequately concerned about? Yes, the um, lesbian, gay community there might be particularly aware of this danger. Right. But they are, you know, are we just highlighting the most um, kind of you know severe case? But there are all sorts of other implications of, of uh, um, yeah. you know privacy. We've heard it previously with HIV/AIDS, and you know each time there's a, s a social issue that highlights the dangers of people not understanding the importance of having um, a privacy framework in which to, you know. Secure your human rights and, importantly, be able to enjoy, enjoy the benefits all of but all the these economic services you, you, you that are now offered. Uh, you can't expect the internet to sort of propagate and reflect better values than are at play in the wider society that we are talking about. And Absolutely. in the case of Africa, yeah. many nations in Africa, that. <laughs> that is a fundamental problem because there are, are real issues. Yes, but our solutions have to look at what's happening on the ground. 
we can't sort of, we, we can't say, oh, there's a big access problem, oops, big hole, moving right along. Um, oh, yes, there are no human rights. Well, we still think the internet you know, needs human rights as a base, etc. And so we're just going to, the solutions are not going to work there. And we've seen that even in earlier reforms, in telecom reforms, etc., where people, you know, for economic imperatives were willing to overlook the absence of human rights, the absence of um, political will to do certain things, the absence of you know, independent institutions to create fair playing fields for businesses, for comp competitive services, etc., in order to get into those markets and grow those markets. So you know, allowing economic imperatives to override political imperatives. So we can continue to you know, say, oh, well, we, we, can't, we can't endorse that. Obviously, you can't. But you know, how, if we're going to find solutions, what are the solutions under those circumstances? And I think there are interesting solutions. I mean, I think there are interesting examples of ways in which, um, particularly in relation to ICTs, but in a number of areas, there are innovations around the lack of trust that, that people have of their governments, of their banks, etc. And I think if you look at something like you know, prepaid services and mobile money, which had no personal identifier, the number was purchased anonymously, there was nobody who could ever track you, all that had to, the only information that had to be gathered was whether there was enough airtime in one account to transfer to another account. There was no record of that, other than the reconciliation of the companies. Nobody knew who had those numbers. So these assumptions that there has to be, you know, these enormous amounts of personal information collected um, in order to create security is actually, um, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't um, resonate with the experiences of people on the ground. Okay, well, that, that's fascinating. We might pick up on that uh, as we go through the discussion. But, Mahima, I don't know if you want specifically want to talk about India, but, um, again, this issue of how you see the privacy argument playing out in the work you do. Okay, so let me talk about India, since we're, you know, we're talking about privacy and we're talking about is privacy dead? Uh, what is privacy? If you look, I don't know how many of you know about India and Indian laws, but, you know, the Constitution protects freedom of expression and the Constitution protects the right to liberty. But we don't have a specific constitutional protection for the right to privacy. Uh, and this is, might be a cultural norm, that privacy means something different in India. But of course, there is a right to privacy in India. And what's happened is the right to, uh, the right to liberty has been interpreted by the courts over the years as a right to privacy. And also, you've seen case law develop over the years. You know, different cases have come to the courts, which have had uh, cases of wiretaps, for example, or certain business uh, you know, oriented cases. And the right to privacy has then entered the Indian legal system in different manners, in different uh, judgments. So that's one thing. You know, you talk about what is the right to privacy in India. Well, we're creating the right to privacy in India. What we have right now is a bill being drafted, which is circulating, which actually talks about privacy principles that the country should have. And this is, you know, when we, when we listen to Western notions where the right to privacy is absolute or where the right to privacy is very protected, it's a different cultural context and a different legal context in India. So I think that's something to also understand with different countries, that we see it in a different way. And for some of us, we are developing these rights and these principles right now. Uh, the same uh, can be said about data security. The Indian IT industry, of course, is a very big industry in India. And through the years, because they've had international clients who've expected a certain degree of data protection, the industry has risen to that, those demands. And so they have come up with data protection norms and standards. But right now, we don't have an overriding law that protects data in a coherent manner. You know? And that's something that's being talked about in India. Uh, you talk about... Um, well, what do you think yeah. Indians think about... Um, going online and, and the assumptions they make about what happens to the information they put up on the web. Do you think Indians approach it with a certain degree of sort of skepticism stroke cynicism and assume that what they do on the web is going to be public and will be uh, seen and used and manipulated either by government or by big business? I think I would agree, uh, you know, I think a lot of people who are going online, they're not thinking about the way their data and where their data is going to end up who's accessing their data. I think people don't think about privacy. They give out a lot of information. We see a lot of uh, talk on social media, which is actually, is at times, very abrasive. And, uh, you know, it can, it can be quite, uh, 
uh, well, abrasive is probably the right word, but people don't understand that your information is out there. Uh, this is not a platform just to say what you want and do what you want, but there are rules of the internet. Your IP address can be tracked. I think people are trying to, people are understanding what the internet really means. If you give your information to a particular company, they might sell your information. It might end up somewhere where you don't know. So I think I would sort of agree with you that Indians right now, when they give out their data, when they access social media, they are now beginning to understand. We've had so many problems, and uh, you know, I would say civil society and people like our organization have been flagging these issues, that people say what they want because they don't realize there are rules. Uh, the IT Act, and a lot of the police machinery don't understand what the IT Act actually prevents and what the IT Act should allow, what freedom of expression really means. So we've had a lot of cases of wrongful arrests in India. You know, yes, of course, you should not be inciting violence. But a certain criticism of a government does not mean it's inciting violence. And so that legal protection is not offered. You know, so I think that as India develops, these laws are being developed and these laws are being challenged by civil society, by academics, and it's a very healthy process going on in the country. All right, well, Ihab, I guess same sort of opening thought from you then. Um, based in Khartoum, I imagine you do a lot of work, I'm guessing, in the region, East Africa and, and uh, maybe wider Africa, I don't know, but give, it, give us your take on how privacy plays out and where it sits in people's mindsets as more and more um, people ac across the nations of Africa seek to take advantage of um, the digital age, wh wh where concerns about privacy sit in their minds, do you think? Okay, so I, uh, like you, I was here last year and may I add, um, I looked at your socks last year, I was so <laughs> impressed, <laughs> and I decided as a typical competitive <laughs> African man to beat you this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, you know what, I, I, I've gone down, down, down beat and you've gone way up. <laughs> right. uh, so my participation here last year, I was coming from the telecom side. I was running a, a national telecom operator, and this year I participate from the civil society side. Um, if I Tell us exactly what your company does. Uh, now we are involved in uh, telecom, media, and technology projects. Um, uh, we are an advising um, uh, company on um, internet uh, freedom uh, issues in, the, uh, in uh, Sudan and the Sahara region in, in Africa. Um, if I can divide privacy into five uh, areas. I think we talk about privacy overall, but I think if we look at privacy, there is uh, two types of privacy involving the government, which is public speech online and private speech online. Personal communication between me and, and somebody else, whether it's email or voice or video. and. Uh, there is two types of privacies involving companies or businesses. Uh, free services uh, that I use and I am willingly uh, agree to that terms of conditions and provide a lot of information about myself. Uh, and also financial institutions, banks, eBay's, commercial, while I'm doing um, a, a transaction. And finally, I think the fifth type of, of uh, privacy issue comes from transactional uh, information about myself, which in essentially involves telecom companies uh, who are carrying uh, that traffic from me to the other destination online. And I think based on where you are in the world, it makes a difference which one of those five is more important to you and you should be more concerned about it. If you are in a developing world, if you live in Sweden, um, it's a totally different mix than if you live in Sudan. Sure, so I'd like to ask you, as you were in the telecoms um, business for a while before this consulting job you now do, uh, how much pressure did you come under from the government of Khartoum to invade people's privacy, given that you were heavily involved in you know, internet service provision and uh, what compromises did you make? <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. I'm actually, <laughs> I think yeah, there is... I, I, the answer is going to be even more interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so get on with it. I think there is a reason I am a former CEO of a national telecom operator that is uh, um, fairly controlled by the government. 
Um, also, actually, I'm accompanied here in this room with the former regulator of the telecom uh, services in Sudan. So well, maybe we should invite him up. <laughs> you, 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 you can give us your, both your perspectives. But, but seriously, it's not, you know, right. the panel, if I'm really honest, you know, it's so much easier at these internet forums to get people from NGOs and campaign groups up on stage to talk about their concerns and their fears. But it's great to have a bloke who actually ran, uh, you know, uh, a, a comms company, as you say, closely working closely with a government which we know, as Alison has said, in the context of many African nations, a government which we know is repressive and which has major problems with genuine freedom of expression. So tell us <laughs> what they required of you and tell us, frankly, why you are not doing that job anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, it's... As a citizen in a country like Sudan, or a citizen in a country like Sweden. And by the way, the similarity between these two countries ends with the fact they both <laughs> start with an S, <laughs> right? Um, it, I, data, if I go back, I, I, I'll answer your question. Yeah, I'm not I, running away from it. we don't have a couple of hours, right. so you're okay. going to have to be really... Very good. <laughs> I want you to get to the point here, you know. Okay, I'll get to the point. So out of the five uh, types of... of privacy that I talked about, the two that involve the government. I think it's being collected by governments uh, all over the world, unfortunately, whether you are in Sweden, whether you're in Sudan, whether you are in the United States. I think as a citizen, I will not be so much concerned with my data collected in Sweden because I know there is a due process of the law and my data is mostly protected. If I'm in a place like Sudan, I am concerned because the same legal protections are not there. And governments um, in places like Sudan um, collect most of the data themselves. So they do not even, as telecom providers, a lot of times you essentially have to give direct probes to the government into the networks so they can collect the data without even the involvement of uh, telecom companies. You have to. You, you, it it's, it's part of your licensing yeah. process. And by the way, this is not just in Sudan, this is in most developing countries. And after the Snowden uh, revelation, we realized it's also happening well, in, in a lot of developing countries. Yeah, I mean, I can almost they hear want. Edward Snowden, if he's watching you know, via the web link, saying, you know what? There's probably more in common between Sudan and some countries in the West than you ever realized at the time. So to go back, I don't think the issue, unfortunately, we're ever going to be able to stop governments from collecting data. It's what they do with that data and how is that data guarded. It's, I think, a lot of us as citizens, we fully expect that private communication online should remain private and privileged, just like me and you going into a private room and having a private conversation. However, I think it's naive as individuals to expect that our public speech online is going to be private. Because if we sit in a room like this, without even the web, without anything, and you make a public statement, then you're giving the right to anybody to listen and to record it and to do anything with but it. But I'm not really clear that this differentiation between private and public is, is workable anymore. I mean, no, how can you define what is truly private and what is public on the internet? If I, I make a public post on a public uh, blog to anybody or I make a public tweet to everybody, that's, that's public speech. But if I write an email to you or to my friend or to my co-worker, that is a private communication and it should be respected as such. I have a much bigger issue with governments snooping into those private communication and playing with it. Public speech is public speech at the end. You give everybody the right to, uh, to, to look at it and to record it and analyze it and, uh, and whatever. So I am more concerned about my private speech. Right, but, uh, you know, uh, and I'm opening it up now, but when, when you, uh, say, take Twitter, for example, you know, when you direct reply to a friend on Twitter, you're saying you absolutely believe that has to be private and remain private, whereas if you put out on your public Twitter feed a comment, 
you're happy for that to live forever and be stored wherever it can be stored. I and you think that there you know, needs to be a way of ensuring that one is white, one is black, and never the twain shall meet in gray. No, it's, it's everything is gray, unfortunately. However, as I said, as citizens, we should not naively expect that our public speech is going to have the same protections as private uh, communication. It is our right to demand that our personal private conversations to remain that way. It is probably unreasonable to expect the same will happen to our public speech. Okay. Well, I, in a second, I want to get to uh, issues about how we can, in a sense, hold to account the, the collection of data, how we can audit how data is managed, stored, collected, both when it comes to the state and private enterprise as well. But before we do that, I promised I was going to get Marcin more involved. So Marcin, tell me there's been a, a few comments on Twitter, and if there have, just talk me through a few of them. Yeah, of course. Uh, Twitter is still discussing this, just as, as you are. Uh, Two worries from, from the internet. First of all, the, the notion about pr privacy being dead online, it's not really something that's comforting people. Uh, so, so we need to address that in a, in a more specific way, how, how to solve that, because the internet wants its privacy back, basically. Um, another other comment is that, I mean, the collection of data is worrying people, uh, because governments do change, but data doesn't. Yeah. I, I'm just wor I'm wondering how much, Everybody listening to this really does, in the end, focus on the state and on government. And because I, I'm in a way trying to encourage people to think beyond that, because there's going to be so much discussion of what the state and government does, and it, it, it's obviously of primary importance. But I am actually also interested in in what big business in in the West and the emerging economies is also doing, and how much we th we are aware of the degree to which we are commodities. We, everybody who uses the internet is a commodity. And, you know, rather than them selling things to us, you know, we are being sold in many ways. Our information, our lives are being sold and commercialized, and we don't even know about it. And I don't know whether people really care about that, whether that's part of this debate or whether we're so stuck on our concerns about big government and surveillance societies that that other element of, of this um, just goes sort of unnoticed, uncared about. What do we think? I cannot run away from the governments and their responsibility, <laughs> but I can, I can bring into picture uh, Google, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, I, I, please do. Yeah. I'm always up and for discussion about Google. Yeah, and uh, uh, the recent decision by a court uh, of justice in Luxembourg, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, famously called right to be forgotten, and it's uh, very much uh, related to, to, to privacy. Yeah. Um, and in a way, it's a, it's a very controversial uh, decision. Uh, in my view, uh, I think it's fighting uh, windmills. Um, it's done uh, for very you know, good reasons, uh, to protect uh, certain privacy but, uh, of, of uh, Spanish citizens who started the process. But if you read the judgment and if you look you know, what is exactly there, it's in a way uh, more right to get away with things than right to be forgotten. Um, and I criticize this as the OSC representative on freedom of the media because I think it can, in a long run, affect freedom of expression and free flow of information and ultimately investigative journalism online uh, and offer some kind of, because everything that is published about certain persons stays in the papers and then the search engines will have to, you know, uh, use certain tools, intermediaries, uh, ISPs, um, also some uh, quasi-judicial agencies uh, and uh, data protection agencies that will have to take uh, down uh, certain information about certain citizens that feel you know, this can affect their life and it's something that happened long time ago. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure this is going to work. Uh, but that battle was fought in the name of privacy. Exactly. And I do not think it's so going to solve. So now you're anti-privacy. No, I'm not, because I think you know this is not going to solve it in any way. It if if you know you are just citizen, ordinary citizen, and uh, if I'm an ordinary citizen, and I decide I don't know 15 years later um, to run for a 
mayor of a certain city. And I know, I mean, 15 years ago, I did something, you know, I, I really Let's don't... Let's say you were a member of a far-right organization in yeah. your youth. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I'm not saying you were, yeah. but let's no, no, imagine no, no, you No, I were. don't have problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your views have changed. You've become a good old European liberal in exactly, your yes. later life. And I want to run for a parliament, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And there is something, you know, you put Dunja Mijatovic in Google search and then you find, you know, that I was, uh, whatever, on the streets of, of Sarajevo, which is my hometown, you know, fighting for a far-right, uh, yeah. you know, ideas. Yeah. Is this something to be hidden from public? I don't think so. Yeah, well... And I do not see this as a, as a protection of the, uh, privacy at all. But it's this is why I think, you know, the, mm. the notion of privacy is a very exactly. flexible, fluid, and actually hard to define thing. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I think that the governments are sometimes engaging and, and reaching out to, to protect the citizens by making a decisions that sounds wonderful, and you think, you know, that's going to solve certain problems, but in a way, in the online world, in digital era, I think we need to have more flexibility and acceptance on, of certain things that are present now more than we had this before. What is also important here is that we see that the issue of, of uh, privacy, in a way, and the protection of privacy, and the way this is dealt with in Europe at this stage, with this decision, is going to affect how is this um, seen and, and done in some countries that are far away from, from even you know, being in emerging democracies. If you can do this in Europe and protect European citizens by saying, you know, yes, data protection agencies are going to engage in uh, taking down certain um, um, information from Google search. And this is not only about Google, it's all search engines, but we are very much aware that Google is the, 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 the biggest one uh, with the biggest uh, impact. Um, and is this going to solve the problem? I don't think so. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I have a great concern as somebody whose mission is to promote free media and free expression that this can affect journalism, investigative journalism and free flow of information in the internet and not really protect privacy. But of course it's too early, but I use uh, um, one of the tools I have in my toolbox and it's called early warning. Uh, and also, uh, it's, it's important to see how is this going to affect some regimes and some countries that are even within the OSC already looking at their decision and saying, wow, now we can do this. You know, you can take down the information uh, that you do not like. Uh, and of course, it's not that easy. It has to be done in the proper procedures. But if you have um, data protection agencies, privacy agencies in certain countries dealing with this and not the courts, I think it's very, very problematic. Right. I mean, um, information commissars and data protection legislation, we, we're sort of familiar with that in Europe, but I just wonder, is that uh, something that's happening, um, you know, in your different parts of the world and is, it, is there any confidence that it, it, it can work? You know, I think this is the, the problem with um, ad, you know, just adopting standards and practices and best practice um, into environments where um, you know, the f legal frameworks, the independence of the courts, mm. and all of these mechanisms that might be used to try and safeguard privacy, freedom of expression, etc., um, aren't in place. Um, and that's why I was saying I really think we need to think you know, very innovatively about you know, how we apply these. Um, very often this, um, I think what Gus was saying is here, is called this policy laundering, um, you know, post 9-11 policy laundering. And I think it's very difficult to separate out the surveillance and other issues. But just to give you an example of, of their interco interconnection, um, you know, African government, many African governments who've failed to um, Get, 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 provide people with access to affordable internet, um, you know, fail to set up independent regulatory regimes, etc., have probably in one of the most successful regulatory interventions on the continent um, set up massive um, surveillance um, operations and so-called cybercrime regimes mm. and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I think, I think there's, there is the, when there's an um, alignment of interests between northern governments and southern governments, um, things happen quite fast. And you get the same, um, you know, um, implementation of, of standards and of practices in that um, surveillance regime without the corollary de developments in the privacy you know, freedom of expression regime, etc., And, you know, it has implications on the way, you know, you've been speaking about business and, you know, these 
big networks on which we're now, yeah. we're now dependent. Um, but for example, we, we did a study on, on cloud services for UNCTAD last year, prior to the revelations, prior to PRISM, um, and several um, African businesses, particularly it was a big issue in Ghana, said they didn't want to use cloud services because that data was stored um, in the US. And prior to PRISM, there was a sense that there was a collaboration between the US government and whatever. So although for Europeans, the fact that, you know, um, internet governance and ICANN and everything else is you know, at least with the Americans and not the Chinese or the Russians or something else, for a lot of people outside in the global south, um, it's not much better to have it there. Yeah. And it impacts on you know, the ability to use these very valuable developmental um, you know, tools like cloud services, which could help public sector development, could help SMEs, um, but there's a, there's a reluctance to use those. And then there's the solutions, when one applies those you know, best practice standards of um, retaining data um, you know, in country and those kinds of things, may mean that in certain countries, the data is actually kept in a less um, safe environment for individuals than if it were in some other regime that is also having you know its rights eroded, but at least there's some relief to independent courts, um, to a rule of law and you mm. know, legal systems. Mm. I mean, I, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to say any more from it. I just want to, anybody wants to get involved from the floor right now, because I don't, I don't want to hog all the questions, not least because you have much better questions than I do. So uh, I'll tell you what, we'll start with the lady here, and then we'll go over to the gentleman at the back. But if we can get the microphone to the lady uh, with the black T-shirt who's got her hand in the air with a pen, and she's heroically keeping her hand up, <laughs> although she's now put it down. There she goes. Right, ma'am, you get the first question. Go on. Uh, tell us your name and give us your question. Um, my name's Emily Taylor, and I just wanted to respond to your question, Stephen, about worry about big companies and why people here might tend to be focused more on governments. And I think the big companies lack the coercive power that gov governments have. It's an obvious statement, but um, many in this audience clearly have direct experience of that coercive power and the example of the Ugandan bloggers who are imprisoned came up in the last session. But I share your worries about big companies and big data and I think the European Court of Justice judgment that you referred to does try to articulate how finely poised the equation is to balance all data um, and, and, you know, and free speech. I think it comes from the realization that European leaders had that they're unable to protect their citizens from the, 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 um, uh, the, the work of big companies. They're not set up to protect fundamental rights of citizens, and they tend to take self-protecting, quite conservative decisions. And that is something I think we should be worried about, and I'd like to hear the panel's views on that. Good. All right. Um, we'll bear that in mind, and we'll just... I did promise the gentleman at the back, and then we'll, we'll do two at a time, otherwise we lose track of the questions. So, j sir, you go ahead. Hi, good morning. My name is Eduardo Bertoni. I'm a law professor at... Palermo University in Argentina. Um, it's, it, it is a question, and um, Steve, you started this panel saying that privacy is death as a question. The first reaction of one of the panelists was that she thinks that privacy is not death, but is uh, you know, some sort of trend to uh, redefine privacy or something like that. And if I understood correctly, you say that that is worse than saying that privacy is dead. Uh, then, just after coming to the floor, Steve, you recognize that privacy is a very fluent, flexible concept. So, my question is, what's wrong with thinking in redefining privacy as a right, as a concept? Because this is exactly what is going on, in my view. One of the gentlemen in the panel said that the expectation of privacy now in the digital world is different. And we used to define privacy in the ways of expectations of privacy. So I'm not seeing any problem in discussing red the redefinition of privacy, but I would like to hear more comments coming from the panel about this idea that we are in a moment redefining a concept, redefining a, a right, and this happens in the history of the world mm. many times. So why we cannot redefine privacy okay right now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. So um, over here we had just this, you know, uh, uh, um, contribution asking you guys to think hard about 
corporates, the, the big private sector companies who've monetized the web in ways that you know, have produced profits of multi, multi billions, also turned us all into commodities to a certain extent. And the thing that gets me is, you know, we really have no idea of just how pervasive this sort of relationship between our data and the, 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 the profit, the, the monetization of our data by these corporates, how it works and how far it goes, how extensive it is. So how concerned should we be by that? Because in a way, you know, it's, it's more, more invasive on a daily basis than all of this government surveillance looking for sort of troublemakers, human rights activists who might be, you know, uh, a problem for a particular government in a particular part of the world. That's terrible, and we've discussed that at length, and we'll discuss it plenty more. But what about the invasiveness of companies that are going to lengths we never dreamed of to use our information in ways that we don't want? Stefan, if I can take that. I, I think if you are a citizen in a developed economy, this is, should be your biggest concern. Uh, this agree, you accept, you click on every day uh, to the terms and conditions, you don't realize there is no such a thing as free. Uh, there is, they used to say no free lunch and there is no free app or free service online. You're either paying money for it or you are paying with your data. Yeah, you you uh, are being sold. Exactly. Yeah. And it is companies that are making money off of who I am. Uh, and having an accurate description of me being sold that are most concerning to me. Uh, because sooner or later, there are companies who can put a very, very accurate profile of who you are, what you like, what's your height, uh, what's your favorite color and food and uh, what brand, you know, anything and, you do. And they have, why should we be, you know, I just want you to be clear about this, why should we worry about that? Because the company, if I were the company, I would say, but that's great, you have, you know, we're going to give you more and more lifestyle choices, we're going to make your life easier and easier, we're going to offer you things you didn't even know you wanted, but you'll realize you did want them as soon as we offer them. You know, we are your friend, and we are maximizing our friendship in this way. Because I do not necessarily want a, a public profile about me. I don't necessarily want everybody to know that I like, um, you know, red socks. Unless well, I say show something it off. much more controversial than red socks. But okay, let's stick yeah. red socks. I wanted to keep it. Uh, and, and you think that is a real concern? But you're saying absolutely. it's more a concern for the developed world, the rich world, the north, than it is if you're sitting in... If you live in Sudan, there are no credit cards, there are no... Um, so, Google is not trying to put a profile about you because they can't sell you anything, so... Right. <laughs> and, and India? What about India? I would, uh, I would agree with you that it's true. A lot of people are not connected, they're not using uh, credit cards. There are e-commerce platforms that have had to do cash on delivery because people are not comfortable with putting their you know, credit card information, even if they were to have a credit card. So I think when you start talking about developing countries, and again, I'll go back to India, the problems are different uh, specifically, but of course the themes are quite similar. So one of the projects that the government of India has taken on, which I think a lot of you will know about, is a national ID card. Uh, and the theory behind it is that every resident of India should have an have a identifier and that identification would be basically based in your biometric information so that the government can actually determine that you are who you say you are and especially in terms of the population that needs benefits from the government in terms of you know, social security benefits and food and things, um, that makes uh, delivery platforms much easier for the government. Uh, this is a PPP project in a way. It's being done with business. So some pretty big IT firms have powered this idea. And uh, what happens over here in India is that people are used to having multiple IDs. I have an election card, I have a driver's license, I have a PAN card, you know, I have, a, I, have a, I have many cards. So when the government tells me to sign on for one more card, sure, I'll go sign on. Yeah, yeah quickly. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly um, say a lot of the big data issues um, don't really require personal profile. It doesn't matter that people aren't using credit cards. I mean, the, the, the value of big data is that you've got you know, massive amounts of, often it can be anonymized, um, data that can inform you know, for good and bad, but could also be reclaimed as a public resource if it's actually created out of public activities. Um, you know, information around um, 
cell phone movements of, of cell phones can be invaluable for transport departments planning that don't that lack those kinds of statistics yeah, or disease control whatever or sort of thing, so yeah. I mean creating um, environments in which um, big data could be used in a way that is anonymized that doesn't reveal the personal you know details of people but in a, in a public interest way would be a you know a way sure. of positively uh -huh. exploiting it would that. and, and yeah. that raises the good old word trust you know yes. the extent to which people trust that it will be used in that way properly anonymized and done for a public good yeah. rather than for a, 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 a private profit yeah. uh, and more exploitative but you know that that's about trust and it's about what and we see both in the developed and, and developing and world. access to information. And there are a whole lot of um, constructs which we, one could use in order to, to gain that, which is at the moment just seen as you know, commercially acquired okay. information. All right. But it's questionably so. Just briefly then, on, on we, we sort of talked about this, but if anybody feels strongly to, to just give me their reaction to the gentleman at the back saying, you know, what you guys, or a lot of people who come to these um, events, essentially bang the drum for, you know, retaining a fundamental right to privacy without ever addressing, perhaps in detail, whether we do need to redefine privacy and, and actually come up with a, a, a new way of, of looking at privacy for the, for the age of the internet. You know, we're, we're, it's no, we're not going backwards, we're going forwards, and, and old ideas of privacy probably aren't going to be relevant by the mid or end of the 21st century. Mm. So I'm going to speak slowly so that people don't confuse what I was saying uh, earlier. When I said uh, that yeah. it's worse when governments say that privacy, you know, when governments are trying to redefine privacy, it's worse than saying that privacy is dead. Because when you say privacy is dead, that's probably a much better factual representation of what the government or states or corporates are are involved in now. What's worse is when governments try to legitimize mass surveillance, when governments try to bait privacy against security, when privacy is being redefined as saying, you know, of course if you're putting something online, even if it's in a direct message or in an email, um, it, it will be leaked out somewhere. So and you're, you're worse so that, you know, you're if you've saying got nothing it's a to healthier, hide. Sorry to interrupt. But you're saying it's a healthier mindset for us all to have, whether we're in the north, south, east, or west. It's a healthier mindset to sort of say to yourself, privacy is dead, and I should approach my internet life with that in mind. Is that what you're saying? No, I think it's a healthier approach to know that we now have factual evidence that governments around the world are investing heavy sums of money. I mean, if privacy was dead, why is surveillance technology a multi multi-million dollar industry? It isn't. But there are active attempts to curb it. And we, when we know that, not only do we make informed decisions, there's been a lot of discussions about corporates, we also push back on corporates, big companies that are collecting data. We also push back and tell them it's not fashionable for you to have all our information. It's not okay for Facebook well, to roll out creepy... I have to say, I don't think the pushback push hasn't worked, has it? I mean, there ha no, there has been pushback, and well, it's, well, it's, it's a, I mean, uh, there has been pushback even before PRISM, even before NSA, um, EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, has been for years now publishing Know Your Customer, um, you know, uh, guides for companies. They have been working on litigation, pushing back companies as well. Yeah, uh, but the, the no success of, of Google, Facebook, da, 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 all of these companies suggests that you call it pushback, but whatever doubts you and, and perhaps quite a few people in this room may have about their, their use of data and their trustworthiness, people are most people do not. Or at least even if they do, they don't care enough to not use them. That is true. A lot of people do not care enough to not use them because these applications are free and because they are popular. And they that is partly work. true, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they do not care about their privacy or they do not care that these governments need to change. If that was true, companies like Google, there's a lot of mention of Google, would not be publishing transparency reports, will not be suing the government post Snowden. But at the same time, I think it's too pronged. One, that definitely there needs to be a pushback on corporates and the word that you use, commodified, we are commodified and they're making profits. But secondly, it has to come, the reform has to come from the government as well because then we have examples of companies like Lavabit that are slapped with sanctions, shut down, and then we ask Google why, if a company as small as Lavabit can push back, why Google wasn't able to push back or why Facebook wasn't but able to push you're back. You're saying something interesting, why? you're saying Google behaves better today than it did 
two years ago because or of the pushback. Or Google or other companies are now at least making an attempt to appear to behave differently. Ah, well, publicly. that's an interesting way of putting it. I think I have a panel with a Google bloke later. I hope he's here. I hope he's not going to run away before we start. But, <laughs> but uh, it, it's an interesting point you've made. Um, okay, we're going to go to the front because we haven't done the front yet. So we've got two here. So we'll start with you, ma'am, and then we'll come to you, sir. And Machin, I haven't forgotten you. Just tell me, waggle your hands about if there's something good on the Twitter feed. Um, I'm Carolina. I'm the Vice President for International Policy at Public Knowledge. And I'm from a developing country. I'm from Brazil. And I... Put, put your mic as close yes. as you can to your... So yeah. I really ask all of us here to stop profiling who we are and which countries we come from and something is better from one country and is not for another. I think that's really dangerous. Brazil, we are now discussing uh, in complement to the Marco Civil uh, Data Protection Bill and we are a developing country and we need that. And the Data Protection Bill came as an answer to how companies are using data in Brazil, while the Marco Civil came as an answer how mass surveillance is happening towards Brazilian citizens, including our president. So I think it's, we, we have to really understand the consequences, and I agree with you. In US, was, there was a study that was done that individually our data, even the social security number costs five dollars to uh, buy social security numbers. So our data individually worths actually not much, you know, but it, collectively it, it worths a lot. So in Brazil now we are working with something that's called informed consent, which comes from the health I, the, the, the health uh, uh, sector, right? You have to understand where that comes from and what people will do with your data. It's going to be actually a pretty big uh, challenge for companies to implement, but we're going to have to deal with it as folks have dealt with it in the health sector. So uh, that's one, one comment and, and one ask from the bottom of my heart, let's stop profiling which is better. Because as Nena said in the beginning, the first panel, we need to think about sustainable development goals. And digital inclusion does include awareness about all that. And after the awareness, you have choice. So that's what I would like to ask you. What are the choices we are making here moving forward? What are the actions we should to be gathering around and fostering. Uh, and, and if awareness about privacy should be part of this sustainable development goals, and then uh, each society decides in its own laws how they're going to deal with it. But thank you. Yeah, all right. So th that's a very specific question at the end there. Should privacy, you know, if one is setting out um, new sort of global ambitions, sustainable goals, which include digital access for the world, um, how should privacy figure and how should it be couched? Uh, if I may, since I think I profile a little bit where I come from, uh, my gut reaction to you and what I do believe in is that I don't think we should confuse the right to privacy with the attitude towards privacy. So I think that some people are very, uh, mm. they, you know, they uh, hold their privacy with a lot more dearness than other people. For everyone who wants to protect their conversations, some people don't care if it's out there. Some people want to be social media stars and some people don't want to get on Twitter. So I think the attitudes are different around the world. The attitudes are different even within India. But I think moving ahead, the right to privacy, what happens to your data, whether you personally as a citizen seem to care or not, those rights are what we should be fighting for. Do and that's the kind of legislation that we should... I mean, I just wonder to. whether sometimes, you know, a, particularly post-Snowden, you know, there's such a sort of air of negativity and concern about the internet and the downsides of the internet that it might, it might actually put... You know, we're talking about expanding access and how the internet equals economic and social development and opportunity. Maybe the message these days is becoming a little more mixed and people who aren't online or who are still waiting to to have the wherewithal to get online, I'm beginning to think, well, you know, actually, there's so much talk of the downsides and the negativity of the net. Well, why, why would I want to? Is that a danger? Um, I don't think so. No. <laughs> 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 that is very much a first world, a first world <laughs> sort of concept, is it? Well, I'm not even sure it's a first world concept. I think well, there I just think it's a lot of people outside this room who don't really care yes, well, <laughs> that's true. about it. But I, I, I think it is a concern. I, I, I just wanted to come to the point, I, I do think it's not useful to say, you know, this is better than that or whatever, but I do think the reality is we're dealing with a, a you know, global international um, uh, economy um, and internet, but the actual application, the actual solutions 
happen at the national level. And I mean, this is the real challenge. So, so what is happening at the national level is absolutely critical to, to what your solutions are. The solutions in Sudan are going to be very different from India or South Africa or, or whatever else. So I, 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 yes, we, you know, we want to create this international um, commonality, this international set of principles around which we organize, and of course we want to be um, signatories to these, these, these good pr principles. But the question then becomes, what about the implication? So if you take um, you know, the European directive, which is seen as best practice in this regard, um, you know, established essentially for very mature economies with the institutional capacity and endowments to actually make sure this is implemented, able to enforce it, otherwise it's just pointless. This has basically been adopted in, you know, by ECOWAS as the um, West African standard. Um, there's not the institutional capacity to implement this. We don't know what the enforcement is, but the box is ticked. Right. We've so got it's, a privacy. It's a paper commitment, but yes. it's meaningless. But for people who are actually using the internet, um, you know, it doesn't right. make a big difference. Okay, good point. Uh, so Thanks, Stephen. Uh, I hope you all agree with me that uh, if there is anything which defines globalization, it's the internet, which uh, connects everyone around the world, wherever you are, uh, if there is access, that is. But one thing uh, we're missing here is that we have already given consent. Uh, we're t talking about that uh, box which says, think you agree. And we have given that privacy. We have given the consent to this multinational, say, you name it, Google or anyone, or Facebook. You agreed to give that uh, consent for them to. But none of us, or uh, at least me, haven't read those 40 pages of legal articles, which says, you do this, you do that. Mm. But one thing. Uh, we're discussing here is internet freedom, but I would love to have that freedom to pull back that agreement because in the normal situation where, where two uh, individuals agree or two companies agree, you can really call back that agreement and cancel it. But in the internet case with these multinationals, there is no option, as far as I'm concerned, concerned to go back and pull back that agreement, that privacy statement. You, you have agree or decline, and once you did that, that page disappears. And I would like uh, anyone to explain that to me. Is there any possibility that you can pull back that agreement? That's what I call freedom. Thank right. you. Right. But do you do you use Facebook? I don't personally. Is that because you are not convinced that? No, I, I was probably one of the first people to to join Gmail, and then uh, lately Google Plus came in, and I uh, have some uh, pictures and other uh, Happy New Year message. They just compiled one album and sent it to me. Pick their pictures as they. Uh, right. wished and I said wait a minute now they can pick any picture of me uh, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about then they just put up an album and say happy new year happy 2011 whatever and then here is your album but you're, you're am I right in thinking you're from Addis yes sir yeah so I mean you know there's been some discussion of Ethiopia and uh, uh, the difficulties that people have who express views that are public on the or, or private frankly but but government gets access to them and then acts accordingly in a repressive way. That, I mean, that, is, is that in Ethiopia, do you think there is now a sense, we started with this question, is privacy dead? That, that people online in Ethiopia assume anything they say you know, seemingly in private online is actually never going to be private online? It, it depends. Uh, there is a law which is uh, uh, very uh, defined. It defines where uh, people can, uh, if they people try to incite violence and they're liable to that kind of information. But there are uh, media papers, print papers, and online uh, which people express their views. Uh, but in, in, in what I'm trying to talk about here is my personal uh, freedom to call back agreements and the privacy statements mm. with the multinationals. Mm. Uh, say, uh, Facebook. I, I, don't have fe I don't have Facebook. And I've worked on data uh, probably half of my age. Uh, I was working for different multinationals myself. And I know how data is manipulated and managed. For that reason, I still have found no answer to that point where I can pull back that I agree uh, document and really read it and see it from a practical view after, after any incident. So that's what I'm trying to to share with the, with the audience here. Thank well, you. Well, no, I, I, I thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm not actually going to try and squeeze a few more questions in before we go. But yeah, Martin, go on. Um, yeah, the, the, the internet is still worried about like the, the connection between uh, online privacy and offline privacy, uh, claiming that, I mean, uh, some, some uh, cases that has, that has been raised is, for instance, violence against women offline. 
and also political dissidents offline. Uh, and this is not only concerning difficult countries, but also democratic countries, since we, in the recent European election, had a rise of uh, right-wing or even fascist movements. But you mean there are people saying that comments that are made online are then uh, could be used in repression offline. offline. I mean, yeah, yeah, that you, you, you end up facing serious personal, maybe physical harm because of things that people have found out that you said online. You yeah, so, so just not limiting the, the discussion about privacy to an online context and also trying to disseminate it in, if, into offline. Yeah, yeah, all right. Well, um, we've got a tiny bit of time left. We've got two at the back. So we'll take, you two are quite close to each other. So you, sir, and then um, the, the lady next to you. All right. um, my name's Faye, I'm, fr I'm from Mozambique, and I think one point was covered um, with regards to the people who really care about privacy. Um, in Mozambique, for instance, internet, let's say it's kind of fairly new, so people are educated in knowing what is privacy. People don't know what, what's happening behind the doors, so they'll just be, ah, this is a service, I accept. Some people don't understand English, or some don't even understand Portuguese or whatever other language is local. And those agreements are in a language that they can't understand. So they won't really be able to say, ah, oh, this is what they're going to be using my data for. And as, as I said, most of them aren't educated on what's happening with their data. So probably there needs to be a step back in trying to say, hey, this is what happens when you log into a service or you sign up to an agreement or things like that. And what actions they could take into not sharing much. And that, the repercussions are also something that they don't think about. Mm. I think in the UK, because I've had experience there, people have worried about data protection after companies have started abusing it. They, they spam users and they use that data for different reasons. So that's where people were aware that data is something we need to take care of. So in, in the sense of, let's say, Mozambique, people won't, there will there'll be no consequence right now, but in the future there will be. So and that's what they, they don't know of. Yeah. That's All right. Essentially well, th thank you for that. And uh, that raises questions about uh, education, you know, about how, how people, as they are uh, able to get online, are also sort of given the tools to use that ability uh, responsibly uh, and, and safely for themselves. Um, uh, Ma'am, you, you've got the mic, so give us yes. your point too. Um, my name is Mishi Chaudhary. I'm from India. Um, my point is that. Um, the gentleman earlier said that uh, what is the problem with redefining privacy? We have no problem with redefining anything. The problem is that it's being redefined by the corporations and the governments and not by the people who use the internet. If privacy were dead, Mr. Zuckerberg wouldn't have spent $30 million buying houses surrounding his Palo Alto house. It's only dead for us. Um, the companies are trying to tell us it's a transaction between us when we talk about these things, we agreed there is informed consent, but this is not a bilateral transaction where we, the ones who are being watched, have been informed by the peeping Tom what they are doing. So if the corporations would, this is like when we demand um, labeling in food, we should start demanding labeling by technology companies. Make it easier for us to understand what mm -hmm. you do with our data. Yeah. Tell us what you do, take, sell, who are the powers who can dip into the data by what all methods. Once you've told us, you will know whether people really care about their privacy or not. And here privacy is also about three things. It's about secrecy, it's about anonymity, and it's about autonomy. So secrecy means that I should be allowed to send a message to a person who it is intended for without somebody reading in the middle. And autonomy means, uh, sorry, anonymity means that even if my message has some public content, I should not be forced to say this is from me because in certain areas, whether it's India, Sudan, Ethiopia, wherever, sometimes it becomes important to call out without telling who you are. And autonomy means without coercion or interference by people who have violated my secrecy or my anonymity, I should be allowed to make decisions. So right. that's what I want. No, that, that, that's terrific. And Thank you. That actually, I have to say, because of the time, you're probably going to be the last contribution, but it was a terrific contribution. I'm just going to pick up for the panel to comment if they want to on a, on a couple of points there. Um, 
gentleman from Mozambique made an interesting point saying, you know, uh, frankly, users, people new online in, in, in Mozambique, or it could be a host of other countries, need to be better informed and frankly better educated about right. the internet. You, have, you, you work in Sudan, how do you go about that? There is a lot of work needs to be done, uh, but most importantly, we need governments of developing countries to start behaving responsibly with the data that is available to them due to the advancement in technology. So this is the one point I really want to stress here, Stephen. Irresponsible governments offline are being even more irresponsible online because the technology allows them to be that way. Right. But uh, on the specific point about ed ed educating, you know, governments it's civil can society. be malign and it's can abuse it the internet, but how do you go about uh, at, at, at sort of street level ensuring that when people get online they understand what happens to the information, the, the data that, that they put online? Unfortunately, this effort will fall squarely on the shoulders of civil society. Uh, because remember, some of these governments are not necessarily interested sure. in you knowing a lot about Fully that. Fully understanding what you are entering, yeah. I mean, I mean, I would say yes, governments, but I'd also say um, big corporates and companies that are collecting this, this data are equally responsible for, for this. Um, I think in terms of the issues of, of e-literacy, I think these are, are really a serious challenge because I think the people who are most vulnerable to exploitation around privacy and surveillance are those people who do not know, who aren't aware, sure. and don't have the finances to buy the anti-surveillance you know, blocks and all sorts yeah. of other things or have the knowledge to do it. So I think, they, I, th I think they're actually the most vulnerable, and that's why I think it is important for developing country governments to establish sort of minimum standards of um, you know, requirement, minimum collection of data. Um, to instead of defaulting into just collecting everything you can yeah. from the person on the off chance that you might need it in the future, that there's an at bare minimum requirement on, on what is collected. You're told what is, what is collected. You're told what it's going to be kept for if it's going to be retained. And people will become familiar with it as they, as they use it. I mean, at the moment, um, as, the, you know, as the point was made, you either you inform and consent and use the service, or you don't use the service. That's right. the option. And you know, we're not going to be using those millions of pages of you know, legal um, claims that go with it. So what we need is something you know, very simple that protects um, uh, inf inf individual information and collective information. And, and, and finally then, I, I like the point um, that we just heard about uh, you know, the comparison with food safety and, and explicit <laughs> labeling in foods of what's in, in them, including all the potentially sort of less salubrious chemicals and preservatives and everything else. You know, why technology companies should be required to be much more explicit and to label much more clearly what they do with the data that they collect from all of us, which we simply, at the moment, many of us, have no idea how it's used, where it goes. Do you have any thoughts on that, how, how that can be achieved? Can it be achieved? Well, then we talk about transparency mm. uh, at the same time. Uh, and of course, you know, we should work more um, as internationally in order to make big companies and industries um, be more transparent and be more responsible and accountable uh, to people and to, to, to users, to netizens in this case. Um, how to achieve this? Uh, it also should be um, done in an in a international arena uh, using best examples and um, we heard, you know, we are in a, in, in a gray zone, but I would say that we are still tapping in, in a dark when it comes to all these uh, issues that we raised and we are trying to give answers to. Uh, and I think Mahima was really, you know, I, I really like what you said, you know, we should not mix our attitude uh, and our rights, yeah. because that can, that can also be uh, very dangerous. Uh, and I'm here thinking about many regimes uh, uh, and many countries that I uh, work in and how this can have a very negative effect uh, if bad decisions are done in a developing world. Uh, and the message that is sent um, to these countries uh, when it comes to protection of privacy. Uh, what I would also not like to see is um, 
you know, bad decisions done uh, which would lead to fragmentation of the internet um, that would affect the universality of it because that's something that we keep forgetting in fighting for, for our rights. We should, we should continue, of course, doing it, but with in mind in what, what is the benefit of this openness and universality and, and connectivity uh, and possibility for all of us to, to, to be in touch and uh, to communicate. So. Uh, the message for me would be, you know, do not create uh, safe uh, uh, bubbles uh, in different countries uh, in order to protect our rights because it's not going to work. Okay. Well, I thank you all uh, very, very much. We, we've sort of run out of time. I'm sorry if I've left questions hanging in the floor. I almost certainly have, but, but you know, all of us are probably going to be around for a short, uh, well, for actually for the rest of the day. So you can buttonhole us and have conversations long after this particular session is over. All I would say as we, as we close is that, you know, I, I, I am struck by, in this last year, how many new questions have arisen about what the hell happens to the stuff that uh, we all put online. I'm not sure that we've come up with new answers today, but I think we've heard some really interesting ideas and perspectives from different parts of the world on just how much there is a desire for greater transparency and accountability, not just from states, but from the private sector and the corporates as well. And I think that is important to keep that in mind. So uh, without any more chat from me, ladies and gentlemen, please give my panel a very warm hand. Thank you, panel, very much indeed. Thanks a lot. <laughs>